the National Office of ECO and said, uh, would your presbytery be willing to uh, be on an adventure to see how we can radically transform your churches to grow, to share the mission, to accomplish the Matthew 28 commission from Jesus Christ, to make disciples that make disciples that make disciples and transform our communities. So our council met with one another and we decided we might as well give it a shot. What do we have to lose, right? If we are growing our churches, that's good for everybody. And so as we got through this in January, I met a guy by the name of Paul Borden. And Paul came to us uh, from the, like I said, the American Baptist tradition with a history and a success of going into churches and helping them accomplish the mission that God had set the church for. And that mission is for us to make disciples in our communities, to bring people from darkness to light and help them see the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. So Paul's been uh, through uh, this weekend, will be the seventh of the eight churches that signed up for this. Uh, and we have different levels of where we're all at in this process. Today is uh, the beginning, hopefully, of ours for the next several years. As a part of that, we'd like to bring Paul uh, to give a presentation to teach us this morning why we do this. What are we going? Where are we at? So I'd like to invite Paul forward uh, to share the message with you this morning. Uh, and then, again, as Paul gives a benediction after our hand, we'll roll right into the meeting. So Paul, the Paul is yours. Thank you. Thank you. We've had a great time here this weekend. Uh, Dana Allen, who is the executive of the Synod uh, of the, your denomination of ECO, is actually preaching in East Main this morning in Grove City. But he and I were here all weekend. And uh, we are impressed with what God is doing here. And your church, which has a long history and over the years has done some excellent ministry, we are convinced that your best days are still in the future. And that's what we're here to talk about. And that's what we're here to, when we give the report, we're going to talk about the future for your church and what God wants to do. But before that, I want to spend some time in the Word of God. And uh, to do that, uh, I want you to know when I was a young kid, which was a long time ago, uh, and I learned early on in school that when the teacher wanted somebody to do something, run an errand, or this tells you how old I am, erase the blackboard. I was always raising my hand saying, pick me, pick me, pick me. Because I learned early on in life that the teacher asked me to do something. She thought enough of me to give me that responsibility. Now what amazes me is I've gotten older, I haven't changed. If you want something done, if it's important to you, if it's crucial to you, don't ask Jason, you ask me. Because if you ask me, it tells me what you think of me. Now if that's the way God has made us, how would you feel this morning if God were to come to you, or you, or you, and God would have said to you, I want you to do something special for me. How would that make you feel? Or, what if God were to come to your family, or your family, or your, a lot of good families in this church, but God were to come to your family and say, I want you to do something special for me. How would that make you feel? Or, what if God were to come to Eastbrook Presbyterian Church? A lot of good churches in the area. But God would say to your congregation, I want to pick you to do something special for me. How would that make you feel? Because that's what I want to talk about this morning. What does it take when we raise our hand and we say, God, pick me, pick me. What does it take for God to select us? Now to do this, I'm going to tell you about a Bible story tucked way back in the Old Testament. Don't look at it right now. It's going to take you 10 minutes to find it. <laughs> but it's in 2 Samuel chapter 8. Now, when you look at this story, you realize it's not much of a story. You see, a man by the name of David has recently become king of Israel. It sounds like a very impressive title, king of Israel. Until you realize that most of the nations around Israel have conquered most of their territory. It's like learning that in 1943 you get to be king of France. <laughs> sounds good. Until you realize France is dominated by other countries. It's like king of nothing. And so David has to fight this nation and another nation and another nation to take back all the land God had promised to his people. And 2 Samuel chapter 8 is really the Reader's Digest version of all of David's military campaigns. However, in this story, there's an expression that appears twice. Now, I've learned that when God says something once, it's important. 
But when he says it twice, it's crucial. At the end of verse 6, it says this, The Lord gave David victory wherever he went. At the end of verse 14, it says, The Lord gave David victory wherever he went. And I think this is God's way of saying, David, I want to pick you. I want you to be the king that takes back all the land that was promised to my nation. Now, some of you, you've read the Bible stories. You, you say, well, wait a minute. When David was a teenager, didn't the prophet Samuel take an animal's horn filled with oil, go down to David's house and pour that oil over David's head and say, David, God wants you to be king. Well, if God's going to pick you to be king, surely he's going to give you victory wherever you go. Well, if you read the Bible, you know that's not true. Same prophet took a horn filled with oil, poured it over the head of a man by the name of Saul, and said, Saul, God wants you to be Israel's first king. The night before Saul died, Samuel reappears to him. And Samuel says, Saul, tomorrow you're going to die, your three sons are going to die, because you become God's enemy. How would you like that on your tombstone? God's enemy. So just because God picks you to be king, doesn't mean he's going to give you victory wherever you go. And so the question is, why does God do this for David? Well, and that's this story. I think we're given some clues. In those days when armies would fight, they'd find a, a great big piece of flat territory. One army get on one end and one army get on the other side. And kind of, if you saw the movie Braveheart, they just kind of rush together and fight. Now, normally, in David's day, the army that had the most horses and the most chariots defeated the army that had the least number of horses and chariots. Because when the armies would rush together, the horses would hurt and kill and maim, but that chariot was a moving military platform where archers would stand and pick off other soldiers. Now the text tells us that when David began to fight, he didn't have a lot of horses. But as he defeats nation after nation, he gets hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of horses. And David does something really strange. He takes most of the horses and he hamstrings them. He makes them incapable of running fast, of pulling chariots, of being used in battle. Now, I grew up near an army base, and I learned early on about the army that the sergeants run the army. And sergeants tend to have a very limited vocabulary. <laughs> I've often wondered, what did the sergeants say when the order came down through the ranks, take these horses and hamstring them? Let me clean it up for you. Who's the idiot that thought this up? I mean, this has got to come from the Pentagon. This is stupid. I mean, we can use those horses. They can pull chariots. This is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Well, I got the command from the lieutenant. He got it from the captain. He got it from the general. And he got it from the king. Well, if the king says it, we'll do it. But this is stupid. David took most of the horses and made them incapable for war. Second thing David did that was strange. The Bible says as he defeats nation after nation, he gets gold and bronze and silver. He begins to amass a great fortune. But David takes most of that wealth and puts it into an irrevocable trust dedicated to God and makes it untouchable for war. Now we know as a nation, it costs money to fight wars. I've often wondered what David's cabinet meetings were like, something like session meetings. Here's the first page of the financial report. We've got five million here, we've got two million here, we've got six hundred. David, we've got lots of money. And then David passes around the second page of the financial report. You mean we can't spend that five million? We can only spend half of that two million? David, we have wars to fight, what are you doing? Now, if you were a reporter in David's day, and you go to David and say, David, you're the king, you're pretty good at battle, but you're doing weird stuff. You're hamstringing the horses, and you're making most of the wealth untouchable for war, why are you doing it? David's answer would really be simple. I'm obeying God. I'm doing what the Bible says. David's Bible, by the way, only had five books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. I mean, you can read the Bible through in a year really easily in David's day. And David would say, tucked away back there in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 17, there's a whole list of commands of things that kings should do and things that kings are not to do. And two of the things that kings are not to do is to collect a lot of horses and to amass great fortunes. Why? Well, you know why. 
If I'm the king and I'm going into battle and I got lots of money and I got lots of horses, what am I going to trust in? Horses, money. God says, I want you to trust in me. Now, for those of you who are still awake, <laughs> say, wait a minute, Paul. When you start, you say, what's it take to have God pick me? What's it take to have God select my family? What's it take for God to come to East Book Presbyterian Church and say, I want to use you in a very special way? Are you simply saying, obey God? Because if that's what you're saying, I think I knew that before I came to church. You just wasted 10 minutes of my time. Now make no mistake about it. God wants us to obey Him. He wants to serve Him. He wants us to honor Him. But if you want God to pick you, if I want God to pick me, there's more to it than simple obedience. As a smart general, David picked off the easiest nations first, the ones with the smallest armies, the less resources. He saved his worst enemies for the end. His worst enemies were the Arameans who lived to the north and the Edomites who lived to the south. Now they were not only great warring nations, they were pretty smart. They saw what David was doing. And so the text tells us that they formed a treaty. The day they formed this treaty, David was faced with a two-front war, enemies to the north and enemies to the south. On December the 8th, 1941, the United States declared war against Japan and its allies. On December 11th, 1941, we declared war against Germany and its allies. Now, when we did that as a nation like David, we had a two-front war. I mean, in our case, it was enemies to the east, enemies to the west. But we had two allies David never had. Those allies are called the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. It's one thing to fight a two-front war when you've got thousands of miles of water between you and your enemy. But the Arameans were at David's northern border, the Edomites were at the southern border. David wrote a psalm about that campaign. It's Psalm 60. And in Psalm 60, David says, in the midst of the campaign, I thought we were going to lose. He said it felt like the earth was going to open up and swallow the nation. He said there were times I felt like a boxer going down for the count of ten. And finally, David and Joab and his army are down at the Valley of the Salt near the Dead Sea. They are surrounded. They're outhorsed, they're outspent, and they're outmanned. And you know what happened? The Lord gave David victory wherever he went. Because David understood, if I want God to pick me, I must obey God to the point of risk. You see, when David hamstrung the horses, made most of the wealth untouchable for war, he put himself, his army, and his nation at great risk. I used to pastor a congregation in Denver, Colorado. We had a guy in our church whose name was Jim. Jim was an electrical engineer. Good engineer, but also an entrepreneur. So he started his own firm, and for years he was just building power plants, lighting for stadium, working all across the United States. But after about seven years of being in business, there was a downturn in the economy, and it was worse in Colorado. And he realized that all of his contracts were coming to an end and he wasn't getting any new ones. He said, Paul, I heard of a major project in the northeastern part of the U.S. It was so big. He said, I knew if I could land the contract, I could keep my company afloat during the recession. He said, I spent three months preparing to bid on that job. He said, it's Friday morning. I'm sitting behind my drafting table, putting the finishing touches on the bid because they're due at noon on Monday and the phone rings. Man on their line says, Jim, you don't know me. But my family is behind the project you're bidding on. Jim said, well, it's good to know you. The man said, you don't know how good. You got a piece of paper and a pen? Jim said, I do. The man said, write down my name. Jim said, I wrote down his name. He said, write down my banking information. Jim said, I wrote down the information. The man said this, write down my savings account number and make sure you record it accurately. Jim said, I wrote it down. Then he said, Jim, it's Friday morning. The bids are due at noon on Monday. On Monday morning, I'm going to check the balance of my savings account. If the balance on Monday is $10,000 higher than it is today, Friday, it doesn't matter what you bid, Jim, your company will get the job. 
If on the other hand, the balance on Monday is the same as it is on day Friday, it doesn't matter what you're going to bid. Because you won't get the job. And with that, he hung up the phone. Jim said, Paul, that was the worst weekend of my life. He said, I had 200 electricians, journeymen, apprentices dependent on me for a paycheck. To buy groceries, to take care of their killed children, to make mortgage payments. He said, I know I could take that $10,000 bribe, put it in that man's savings account, and no one would know. But he said, I also knew what he was asking me was not only unethical, it was illegal. So he said, on Monday, I turned in the bid, and I didn't put a dime in his savings account. About three months later, another man called Jim. He said, Jim, that bid you turned in, great bid. But you need to know, we gave the contract to another company. Jim said, Paul, the next two years were horrible. He said, I had to lay people off. He said, we had to take out a second mortgage on the house. We had to empty our savings. He said, we thought we would go broke. Now that, as I talked to Jim, I said, this is all over now. I said, yeah, we're, we're getting back on our feet. I said, well, then let me ask you. Now that this is all over, how do you feel? So, well, if I'm honest, I got two feet. Some days I think of that guy that called me the first time, and I just wish I had his neck between my fingers. <laughs> I'd like to squeeze rather tightly. But he said, Paul, every day when I walk into my office and I look at my drafting table, I think of that phone call. And I know I'm a man of integrity in here and with my God. That's what it means to obey God to the point of risk. Because I spent 20 years in Denver, I know pastors who had young people in their youth groups who were at Columbine the day of the massacre. In fact, I know pastors who had funerals for teenagers who were killed that day. Most of us as Americans will never forget Columbine. But we've now heard the story of how on that day when those two young men walked into that school and began to hurt and kill and maim. One of those young men put a gun in front of a young girl's face and said to her, do you believe in God? And when she said yes, he pulled the trigger and killed her. Teresa, my wife and I, we have lost two adult children. So we know what it's like to outlive your kids. It's not supposed to be that way. But we don't know what it's like to send your daughter to high school and to find out at the end of the day she has been stupidly, senselessly slaughtered. But there's one thing those parents do know. On that day, as the angels ushered their daughter into the presence of her Heavenly Father, he might have said this, Welcome home. You obey me to the point of risk. Mm -hmm. 1997, we moved from Colorado to California. And my job was to be over what you would call a presbytery of about 220 congregations. Many of these congregations back in the 1950s and 60s and 70s would be large congregations of 300 and 500 and 700. But when we got there in 1997, we did a survey of all 220 congregations. And the average worship attendance of all the churches was 100 people. So I'd walk into churches that used to have 300, 500 people. And there'd be 50 or 60 people. The average age would be somewhere between 65 and 75. No children. No teenagers. In fact, the vision for these older people was they hoped the church would remain viable enough that when they died, they could have their funeral there. I reminded them, that's really not a great vision. I mean, minimally, it takes four to carry a coffin. Somebody's going to have to turn out the lights. <laughs> Who's it going to be? And we went to these people. We said to them, you got a problem. These older people laughed. Problem. We got lots of problems. We don't need you to tell us we got a problem. We don't need people. We don't have any young people. We don't have any children. We don't have any money. Our buildings are falling. We know we got problems. I, I said to him, yeah, I know. You got all those problems. But you got a bigger problem. I said, what's that? He said, here's your bigger problem. You think Jesus created the church for Christians? He didn't. 
He created the church to mobilize Christians to reach people who don't know Jesus. And you've stopped doing that. And you're disobeying Jesus Christ. And the Spirit of God moved through these congregations and these older people said, Paul, you're right. We have stopped obeying Jesus. I said, do you want to obey? They said, yeah, we want to obey Jesus. I said, well, it's going to mean taking some risks. I remember they said, well, what's the first risk? I said, are you willing to sing music you don't like? That's a biggie. I go into these little churches of 50, 60 people. They had 15 committees and three boards. And every year, 50 people had to fill 60 spots. I said, do you have a bureaucracy that would make the California Motor Vehicle Department proud? <laughs> you asked so Jesus said, I am come that you might meet because all you do is meet. I said, if it means getting rid of your bureaucracy to reach people, are you willing to do it? And these older people said, whatever it takes, we'll do it. And God did a miracle. And in five years, from 1997 to 2001, we went from only 37 growing churches out of 220 to over 150 churches growing out of 220. And much of that growth was conversion growth. Every month I would meet with about four groups of pastors to talk about how they could lead their churches to make the changes that needed to be made. One day we met with this group of pastors, and one of the pastors who was always there just didn't show. That wasn't like him. If he wasn't going to be there, he'd phone or email, whatever, but he just didn't show. So we ate lunch, and we started our meeting, and about an hour and a half later, he came rushing in. We stopped to greet him. He apologized for being late. He said, i got to tell you what happened. He said, I literally had my hand on the office door to open it today to come to the meeting when the phone rang. Now, this was a while back, so he said, I had to go back to the desk and pick up the phone. Remember those days? Go back to the desk and pick up the phone. And he said, uh, there was a young man on the, on the line. He said, Pastor, as you know, my wife and I have been coming to your church for about six or so years, and something very important has happened to us. I've got to tell you about it, and I need to give you something. Can we meet for a quick lunch? So he said, we met for lunch. He said, when we sit down, this man said, Pastor, uh, as you know, we've been coming for about six years. But what you don't know is a couple months before we first visited your church, we had just moved to the San Francisco Bay Area of the U.S., which is one of the most expensive places in the United States to live. He said, but we weren't concerned because I had a brand new job. In fact, he said, we had bought a brand new house. We had two brand new cars. We had brand new furniture. We had brand new TV. He said, we were excited. So what you also don't know is about a month before we first visited your church on a Saturday morning, we sat down and we counted up all the debt payments on all the brand new stuff. And we realized that our monthly debt payments were more than my take-home pay. Now, Pastor, you didn't know that. We came to the church. You said, we really liked the church. Your music was upbeat. We felt we could make some friends. You took great care of our babies. He said, but that Sunday we were there, you started a series on financial stewardship. And in the sermon, you said God expects us, if we're going to be obedient to him, to give him at least 10% of our income. On the way home, my wife said, dear, how do you like church? He said, oh, I like the church, I like the music, I think I can make some friends. But he said, what that pastor preached, he said, that's the stupidest thing I have ever heard in my life. We can't afford to eat. He says, we're supposed to give God 10%. That's stupid. He said, now, pastor, we like the church, so we kept coming back. He said, I don't know if we remember this or not, but you did that series for six weeks. And every week he says that we're supposed to give God 10%. And every week I went home and I said, dear, I like the church, but the pastor's out for lunch. <laughs> so about three months later, I came home from church. We fed our babies, put them in their cribs for naps. My wife and I walked in the early room, got down on our knees in front of the unpaid sofa. <laughs> and I prayed. Here's what I prayed. I said, God, if you expect us to give you 10% of our income, we will obey you. And we will do that. He said, well, I said amen. We stood up and I looked at my wife and I said, dear, that is the dumbest prayer I have ever prayed in my life. He said, but pastor, you need to know. We started giving God 10%. I said, you also need to know. Next two or three years, we're not good years financially. 
So we had to sell a car. I had to get a part-time job with my other full-time job. My wife had to go out and go to work. We had to downsize, but we kept giving God 10%. He said, the last two or three years have been pretty good years financially. In fact, I just got a bonus at work. And I wanted to tell you the story and give you my 10%. And with that, he hands the pastor a check. Now, the pastor has come from his lunch to our meeting. He still has the check in his shirt pocket. He holds the check up and for all to see. The check is for $320,000. That's 10% of his bonus. Now, I can just see it in some of your eyes. <laughs> Don't miss the point. Point is not. You think if you give God tithing, he's going to give you $320,000. In fact, right now, I want you to remember the young girl at Columbine High School. See, the issue is not the result. The issue is do you want God to pick you? Do you want God to select your family? Do you want God to come to East Brook Presbyterian Church and say, I want to use you to change this whole moral area for Jesus Christ? God will do it. If we are willing to obey Him to the point of risk. David hamstrung the horses, made most of the wealth untouchable for war, put himself, his army, and his nation at great risk. And the Lord gave David victory wherever he went. We bow with me in prayer. Our gracious God, thank you this morning for telling us this story through the life of your servant David. Those of us who've read about him know that he was far from perfect. He often lied. He committed adultery and tried to cover it up with murder. But on his best days, our God, wow, he was awesome. Because on his best days, he was willing to obey you to the point of risk. I want to ask for two things this morning. I want to ask that you will help all of us in this room to know what that means for us as an individual. But also, what does it mean for this congregation? The second thing I want to ask is that your spirit will so move in our hearts that individually and as a congregation, we will obey you to the point of risk. Help us to understand you don't ask anything of us that you didn't ask of Jesus, your son, who obeyed you, came to earth, and risked everything, including his life, that we might know you. I pray that East Brook Presbyterian Church will stand out from all other congregations in the area because this community of believers says we will do whatever it takes, even if it means risk, to carry out your great commission to make disciples. We will obey. May that happen, not only for the sake of people who right now don't know you, who one day will, but for your honor, and for your glory, and for your reputation. And I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.